Indonesia is an incredible country with 17,000 islands, 800 languages and dialects, and more than 300 ethnic groups. After centuries of oppression, it is looking for a common future and a national identity. The idea of a single national language only came to the fore in the 1920s, and with it emerged modern Indonesian literature. Linda Cristanti writes about the traumas of the past. Oka Rusmini explores the tensions within society. Azari Ayub writes of things that can't be said, writing as therapy as a weapon. Indonesia lies between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. The capital Jakarta is on the island of Java. 30 million people live in and around Jakarta. The city is booming. The country is rich in natural resources. But for a long time, its riches were exploited by colonial powers. Indonesia only gained independence from the Netherlands after the Second World War. When I was a child, I was so happy because I live in Indonesia and this country is very rich and this country has a lot of languages. We have a lot uh, cultural and we have a lot ethnics here. And of course, at the same time, I worry when I'm thinking about how the government can manage this country, how the government can bring prosperity to the people how the government can bring justice to the people or everything because too big and big country has a lot of happy stories and a lot of sad stories too the writer and journalist linda cristanti is all too familiar with indonesia's sad stories every thursday she comes here to the presidential palace to attend a demonstration of political activists and critics of the former Suharto regime. May I read a poem about the people who were seized and disappeared? About our friends who were kidnapped? It's a poem I wrote myself. Words against silence. Linda wants to know what happened to friends and comrades who were abducted during the military dictatorship. The demonstrators chant, we will not be silenced. They call on the president, Joko Widodo, to bring the perpetrators to justice. Suatu hari, kita menyadari telah lelap di sebuah penjara besar yang menghukum pikiran. Tikus-tikus dengan rakus akan menggerogoti sel-sel otak siapapun yang berpikir tentang kebebasan. Penjara ini berlapis-lapis, bentuknya menyerupai labirin. Kami yang tersisa belum sepenuhnya bebas. Tapi cerita tentang kalian yang pergi dan tidak kembali akan menjadi cerita yang terus diwariskan agar api ini terus menyala. Terima kasih, Mbak Linda. Siapa, Mbak? Siapa? The flame of freedom in stone. The huge national monument in the heart of the capital commemorates the struggle for independence after three and a half centuries of foreign rule. Its construction started in 1961, under the direction of the Republic's first president, Sukarno. He sought to unite the nation through nationalism and communism. In 1965, there was a coup. Eventually, Suharto seized power and remained president from 1967 until May 1998. 
he was ruthless in crushing opponents. In the late 1990s, Linda helped organize the student protests that ultimately led to the ousting of Suharto. She went underground and wrote anti-regime articles under a pseudonym. I don't know what happened to us because we are very young at the time. All of us were 20s and we decided to sacrifice our life to the people. And we knew, we knew about the risks. Maybe the government will arrest us, maybe they will send us to the jail, maybe they will kill us, maybe they will make us disappear. Maybe they will send the military intelligence, uh, kidnap us. And all of us, we know about it. We knew about it at that time. But we took the risk because if nobody dares to do that, the country and the people were still the same. No futures for the young generation. Under the dictatorship, leftist writers were banned. Though their works are now available, the ban was never officially lifted. A conspiracy of silence prevails to this day in Indonesia, despite the restoration of democracy. Nobody dares to bring the culprits to justice. It is because of military. They were involved in all of violence uh, cases in Indonesia. Indonesia was built on maybe more than one million dead people, yes. And, and I think it's almost impossible to military, military to say, oh, we will tell you the truth, we kidnap your son, we kidnap your daughter, maybe, we kidnap your husband, and now we want to say, forgive us, it's impossible. It will never, never happen. In her prize-winning literary texts, essays, and reports, Linda writes about violence and terror from Sumatra to Timor. Indonesia suffers from enduring tensions between the interests of the central government based in the capital on Java and those of the other islands. There is little that keeps the regions and islands together. An official national language, Bahasa Indonesia, was only introduced in 1945 after the Declaration of Independence. I have multiple, multi-identity. I was born in Bangka Island. People call me Bangkanis, maybe, because I live in this country. People call me Indonesian. They call me Muslim, Indonesian Muslim. And when I attend a writer conference, they call me Indonesian writer. Uh, identity is, is not something like wood or stones. It's like uh, liquid, yes. The majority of Indonesians are Muslim. Indonesia has the largest Muslim population of any country, and it boasts the largest mosque in Southeast Asia, the Istiqlal, or Independence Mosque in Jakarta, with room for 120,000 worshippers. Linda considers herself a critical Muslim. She's worried that the traditionally moderate Islam of Indonesia could be subverted by more extreme currents. She was brought up to respect others, whatever their beliefs. Little by little, I realize you cannot understand religion if you only read Al Quran because you have to know more about politics and you have to know more about the conflicts between people and why they fight each other in the name of God. 
It was Arab traders who brought Islam to the region. Until then, Hinduism had prevailed. Western colonialists brought Christianity, but it did not really catch on. Many ethnic Chinese here practice Buddhism or Taoism. These days, less than 2% of the population call themselves Hindus. In the northwest corner of the country, on the island of Sumatra, about 1,800 kilometers from the capital, is the semi-autonomous province of Aceh. There are almost no traces now of the tsunami that devastated the west coast of Aceh on December 26, 2004. Amazingly, this mosque remained standing. The tsunami killed 170,000 people in Aceh province alone. For the writer Azari Ayub, the disaster changed everything. I was born in Banda Aceh. I spent my childhood here. Before tsunami, I live with my family. I have one little sister and one little brother. With the tsunami, all of them disappear. It is still hard for him to talk about it, especially here at the beach, where people relax and swim, just as they did before the huge wave struck. His sadness finds expression in verse, but he does not like to read his poems out loud himself. Ibuku, Abah dan Diknong. Setelah bala aku pulang, ingin melihat kalian dan kampu. Kukira 26 Desember cuma mimpi buruk, tapi tak kutemukan kalian di sana. Juga arif kecil yang cerewet. Seperti kalian, kampung kita ternyata sudah tiada, berubah menjadi laut yang raya. He and his family lived just a couple of kilometers from the shore. Vegetation has filled the plot where his home once stood. The entire village was washed away. Before tsunami, we have 700 uh, people, but uh, after uh, we remind 100 people. Aid organizations from 100 countries came to Aceh, a region that had been cut off from the outside world for decades because of the war between separatist insurgents and the military. After tsunami, many projects uh, reconstruction in Aceh and build the many houses in the tsunami area. Half a million people were made homeless here. Most now have a roof over their heads, but in their hearts, they're still suffering. I look like uh, I am stranger here uh, because uh, so many newcomer after tsunami in my village. The village where Asari grew up has been rebuilt. New houses and new residents. For Asari, the place is still full of memories. The first books his father gave him, the first stories he was told as a small child. 
my mother is like a story like a, like a story teller uh, sometime in night or in the uh, afternoon uh, she uh, telling everything what she know huh? uh, sometime about the uh, fairy tale sometime about the gossip and when I'm writing something I stolen the story by my, by my mother Azari now lives on the outskirts of the regional capital, Banda Aceh. When the tsunami hit, he was far away on Java. It was days before he heard that his family had been killed. The pictures on the walls of his home are all of his wife's family. He doesn't have a single photo of his own parents, sister or brother. He says he's frightened. He might forget what they looked like. After the tsunami, tens of thousands of people were buried in mass graves. Many had not been identified. There's now a tsunami museum in Banda Aceh. The names of 5,000 of those who perished are inscribed here. There are dioramas of the event itself and of the aftermath to help visitors understand what happened. Right beside the museum is a Dutch military cemetery, where more than 2,000 soldiers of the colonial power are buried. The Netherlands and the Sultanate of Aceh were at war for three decades until Aceh capitulated in 1903. Achenis uh, define themselves as the fighter. The historic conscience is very high. We are surrounded by the history. Uh, we talk about about uh, previous time, and we don't care about what happened in the future. Aceh is one of the poorest regions in Indonesia. The war that began in the 1970s between a separatist insurgency and government forces crippled the economy for decades. Many people of Azari's age grew up without their fathers. They were away fighting in the underground. Many were captured, tortured, and murdered. Violence was everywhere, even in the most remote villages. And it is very present in Azari's short stories. This is the Aceh Human Rights Museum. It's based in what used to be a private home. Azari is the director. The founder, Reza Itria, who's studying at Harvard, is back for a visit. Where have you been? Oh, you've gained weight. Yes, but it's not from bribe money. After the tsunami, Azari shared this house with other artists and writers who had lost their families. Their small community developed into an art center and a human rights museum. The tsunami prompted renewed efforts to resolve the conflict in Aceh. A peace deal was signed in 2005. To ensure the conflict is not forgotten, the museum collects documents on killings, massacres, arson attacks, abuses the old and the new rulers do not want to address. Anger and resentment towards the government remain deep. We know about Indonesia only one face 
face injustice, uh, face abuse of human rights, and face uh, raping of our women. So we have problem with Indonesia. At midday on Friday, the muezzin calls the faithful to prayer. It is not an invitation, but an order. Aceh is the only province of Indonesia where Islamic Sharia law is in force. It was introduced in 2001, a questionable gift from the central government. When the Sharia law applied, everything is changed. The authority evaluate you every day. You must go to mosque, you must have the standard about what you are wearing. If you go to somewhere uh, with your friend or girl, you will be arrested. For a Chinese, the religious is very personal, right? But the Sharia law, one, the religiosity is become a public. The big brother wear what each other. Azari is a practicing Muslim, but he rejects the idea of being forced to pray. If he doesn't go to the mosque for prayers, he can't be out on the street, so he stays home. He says the government introduced Sharia as an instrument of control. I don't agree with the Sharia law because it is politic. It is not uh, a Chinese willing. It is the Jakarta willing. Jakarta want to reduce the movement of independence in Aceh like a referendum. And when the Gusdur rule in Indonesia, she gave Aceh a Sarin Ahlu. And you know, we are Achenis don't reject something about the Islam. Azari deals with the violent past, not as a journalist, but as a writer. You can write everything with your imagination. You decide it for yourself, but if you are a journalist, you depend on your boss or your uh, newspaper. But you know, newspaper in Aceh in the civil war is very bad. And all of the journalists in Indonesia at the time above of the military. Oh, I can't believe about the journalists. It is 3,650 kilometers from Aceh to Bali, and they are worlds apart. Many Westerners consider Bali a tropical paradise. In the early 20th century, European artists cultivated their utopian fantasy that it was a perfect place where humans and nature were at one in perfect harmony. Bali is known as the Island of the Gods. It has a thousand Hindu temples. The magic of the place is an inspiration for the writer Oka Rusmini. Dari akar, ko ajari aku mengenal warna tanah. Membiarkan perwujudanku menyentuh kedalamannya. Wahai, anak dewa yang memunculkan pementasan-pementasan tanah, biarkan para sang yang mengitari keheraninku. Aku menemukan wangi yang lain dari kedalaman akar yang kutusukkan di tubuhmu. 
kau lihat. Aku mainkan rasaku. Menarik pementasan yang kupertontonkan pada benih tanah. Aku menjelma jadi api. Memutar bumi di telapak tangan. Oka Rusmini has lived on Bali for 25 years. She was born in Jakarta to a Hindu Brahmin family. Bali is incredible. I've worked here as a journalist since 1990. It's been a revelation. A lot has changed on the island. I like to write about that. Not scholarly texts of anthropology or sociology, but works of fiction, novels. I want readers to be entirely immersed in Balinese society, as if they were part of it. The religious ceremonies and rituals of the Hindu population are a captivating spectacle. But they embody a hierarchical caste system, with strict rules and tough sanctions against anyone who breaks them, especially women. If a woman from a higher caste marries a man who is not from Bali or belongs to a lower caste, she may no longer visit her family. She's discriminated against. There used to be a ceremony called patiwangi to expel a woman from her caste and her family if she married beneath her. But it has been banned. There's no patiwangi anymore, but discrimination still exists, as I describe in my books. Women are oppressed not by means of domestic violence, but through psychological violence. Her novel, Earth Dance, is about four generations of women in one family and the struggle for self-determination in a complex and rigid caste system. Things have changed. Nowadays, Balinese women dare to get divorced. They're not afraid to break out of the world of marriage. They have the self-confidence to live alone because they're financially independent. They used to remain in bad marriages even when they were treated badly. But now they take their fate into their own hands and decide what to do with their lives, their bodies, their thoughts, their children, their social status. They're not afraid to make their own decisions. The 21st century has indeed reached Bali. Tourism is the most important industry on the island, and it has been a motor for economic development and for social change. Three million holidaymakers visit Bali each year. The impact of mass tourism on the environment and on the people of Bali is considerable. Paradise is at risk. I can't look up. One's not leaving. <laughs> More and more land is being sold to investors. 
There are even plans to build artificial islands off the coast. That would do more than just disrupt the ecosystem. For the Balinese, the earth, mountains and ocean have very specific meanings. Imagine the sea becomes earth. That's totally incompatible with the Hindu view of the world. It would be a great disrespect to the people of Bali. But tourism does have positive aspects as well. It helps the young to establish contact with the outside world. They get to know people from around the globe and make new friends and learn. I didn't set out to become a writer. I come from a troubled family. My mother left me when I was six. I felt very lonely in this world. I wrote a lot in my diary. Then on my birthday, I would burn my diaries. That was my birthday present to myself during my childhood. For me, writing was therapy. When I was four, I had polio. Before that, I was a healthy girl. Then suddenly I got ill and couldn't go to ballet anymore. I was just a child, but I felt my life was over. Oka is visiting her friend, Chok Abi. He is a fashion designer who studied in London. His clothes are in great demand among the upper-class ladies of the Balinese capital, Denpasar. This is Balinese brocade. The dress was inspired by the sea goddess, Kanjeng Ratu. In Bali, clothing is often closely linked to religious rituals. Chuk Abi has an ability to reinterpret traditional garments, such as the kebaya blouse dress combination that's worn at ceremonies, to make something modern. You can wear it to parties. Oka is a fashion editor at the local newspaper, the Bali Post. Her enthusiastic reviews kick-started Chok Abi's career. It's androgynous. Yes, it's masculine, but the embroidery makes it feminine. And that's the idea. Yes, it's about black and white and two shades of grey, light and dark. The colours represent day and night, dawn and dusk. It's holy material that unites good and bad, sadness and joy. Chok Abi's jewellery is also modelled on ritual objects. Here on Bali, feminine beauty is celebrated. In Aceh, under Sharia law, it is often hidden from view. They are indeed worlds apart. Oka likes to visit the market in Denpasar. She is not only a writer and journalist, but also a wife and mother, and a great cook. She and her family live in a quiet neighborhood. Oh. 
Her son Pasha Renai San helps her make supper. Oka's husband is a poet, translator, and art curator. They met at a poetry festival. Theirs is not a conventional pairing. Oka is a Hindu Brahmin, her husband a Muslim. It's difficult to make a living as a writer in Indonesia. The market is not large, and few works are translated into other languages. I've never regretted being a writer. It's therapeutic for me and for my readers. From Bali, it's now back to the capital Jakarta on the island of Java. Some of the biggest demonstrations during the revolution of 1998 took place at Trisakti University. They contributed to the downfall of the dictatorship and the emergence of democracy. Today's students, living in a free society, owe a debt of gratitude to those of Linda Cristanti's generation who risked their lives to fight tyranny. Linda Cristanti now writes for the fashion and lifestyle magazine Dewi. This is a magazine for women in the middle class and in high class. For me, it's important to let them know about the problem in the society and about how we solve environmental issue problems. Because women from this class, they have a lot of money and they have power. Maybe they can contribute to change the society. Her activism and political work have involved sacrifices. I need a lot of freedom because I'm a political person in my writings. If the Indonesian army or whatever army special force kidnap me, if they kill me, I will not be sad because I don't have children, I don't have husband, I don't have anything. And if I have a family, maybe I worry a lot about my life. She may not have a family of her own, but she has close friends, comrades from their time in the resistance in the 1990s. Back then, Nizar Patria was seized by the military. When the friends meet, they often talk about the past. Today, they talk about the father of another friend who was abducted. Until his death, the father would make coffee every day for his absent son. He was already in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. He was very sad that his grandchildren didn't have a father. He just could not accept the fact that his son was never going to come home again. Mm. Yeah.
Today, Indonesia is a democracy with a fast-growing economy. But it still has plenty of social and political problems. So Linda Cristanti's work is far from finished. I have to keep going. I have to do what I think I have to do. If you want to change something in the society, you have to be brave to do that. Maybe you are not alone. Maybe in the world, there are some people like you. Maybe they live in the worst situations more than me. And because of that, I never feel alone. For Linda Cristanti, it is hard to shake off a sense of mistrust and anxiety. That might never change. But this too is part of her complex identity. She enjoys karaoke. She sings with friends from her student days. Their shared past is an enduring bond. They sing in Bahasa Indonesia, the national language of this huge and fractured country. The language of Indonesia's courageous writers who will not be silenced. <laughs>